This UCSD TV program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest programs. Happy birthday, Charlie. Um, it's very exciting to be part of this incredible two-day Charlie Fest, and, and it's sort of bittersweet to come to the last closing session. Um, universities on the cusp of change. And so what we're going to do is that um, I'm going to uh, tell you who's speaking, and we've got one or two surprises for you. <laughs> and um, then I'm going to say a few words about um, public communication in universities, which is actually very relevant to what we've just heard in the last session. Uh, and then um, Bob Dines, of course, as you know, the uh, ex-chancellor of the UC system, um, ex um, sorry, ex-president of the UC system and ex-chancellor of UCSD, and he's going to talk about some of the changing relationships with industry and research universities over the last 50 years and implications for today and the future. And then uh, Dr. Margaret Leinen, who of course is the vice chancellor for marine science here at UCSD and also the uh, director of Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Um, she is going to um, talk about a couple of challenges that have faced um, universities as opposed to colleges. Uh, one was um, the uh, problems of economics between 1980 and 2000. And then the more recent challenge um, in the last decade or so of the, the rise of um, online education and the challenges that that um, sets for research universities. And then our surprise speaker is not Marsha Chandler because sadly she is sick and can't be with us today. Um, but we uh, actually have the uh, Chancellor of UCSD, um, Dr. Um, Pradeep Koshla, who is going to talk about some challenges about that research universities face in the future. But before they start, I want to say a little bit about public communication. Um, my alma mater was Oxford University in England, and I never forget a very distinguished um, ecologist whose name I'm not going to mention, who said, we don't communicate to the public. If you're very famous, maybe you will give a very important lecture. But otherwise, we leave it to other people to translate science. And maybe in 30 years' time, if your work is really good, the public will learn about it. I remember being absolutely stunned. I mean, this was a long time ago now. This was nearly 40 years ago. But I still thought, that's, that's absurd. There's this huge disconnect, this ivory tower. This, this is not going to last. And of course, it hasn't lasted. And when I came to UCSD to run the Birch Aquarium 12 years ago, I had my first formal meeting with Charlie. And it was the exact opposite. It was wonderful. It was a breath of fresh air because it was so obvious to me that Charlie cared enormously about communicating research to the public and cared very much about places like Birch Aquarium and that Birch Aquarium was a very good way in which he could actually talk about Scripps research to the public. And so I um, was very excited to have somebody like Charlie behind me and I don't think this aquarium would have been nearly as successful without his help. So thank you, Charlie, for that. It has made an enormous difference. And I think it's really important to think about the changes that are happening in the way that research universities particularly are communicating with the public. Uh, I agree with a lot of the past speakers that it is really important for us to reach out and connect to the public in relevant ways, and also to learn how to do it properly. Because if we don't communicate well, it's, it's always worse than, than no communication. Um, and I think one of the exciting possibilities is that there are what I call hidden gems in most research universities. There are botanic gardens. There are art museums. There are libraries. There's even an aquarium. 
there are playhouses. There are all sorts of entities in the university that already communicate with the public and often do it really very well. And I think there is enormous growth and possibility for the universities to use those tools much more than they have in the past, to actually engage graduate students in not only learning to teach, learning them how to communicate with the public and how to communicate their research to the public, but being an incredibly important vehicle for the public in an increasingly digital world to actually have a one-to-one -one communication or with a small group and not just sit passively and maybe see a beautiful lecture or ballet, but to actually be able to have dialogue with these people. And we started a course at the aquarium, um, which is now a, a UCSD course in um, communicating science to the public. It's been uh, incredibly popular and the public love it and the students seem to be highly engaged. And so I think this is an area which has a lot of growth, a lot of potential. It's uh, starting here quite a lot at UCSD, not just at Birch Aquarium, but in, on other parts of campus. Um, and I see it happening um, in the Burke Museum of the University of Washington in Seattle, in the, uh, which is a wonderful museum of anthropology. Um, I see it happening at the Botanic Gardens at the University of Utah, um, and also at UC Riverside. Um, so I've just moved. I've, I've moved to um, New England. Um, so that's why I have to come back to this coast frequently, uh, especially in the winter. I'll probably be back. Um, and I'm at the uh, New England Aquarium in Boston. And of course, as you know, there are one or two colleges in Boston, some of them quite well known. In fact, <laughs> of course, there are some people here today who are at those colleges um, or were at them for their education. And I am <coughs> amazed at how many of those colleges, including Harvard and MIT, who have reached out to the New England Aquarium recently because their students want to work with us, not just behind the scenes with the fish or with the research department or conservation department, but they actually want to interact with the public and start talking about their research and having opportunities for outreach. And I think um, nonprofits, museums, attractions also can play a part in helping to, to teach universities how to communicate with the public in ways that are really important going forward. Um, and now I am going to stop there and I'm going to ask um, Bob Dines to come up and talk. Thank you. Charlie, you're 75 years old. I can't believe it, I can't believe it either, actually. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but congratulations and happy birthday. 75 actually <clears throat> turns out to be not very old. I, um, I refer you to a, um, a book called Tolstoy's Bicycle, which probably nobody in this room knows about. But it's a book which describes major accomplishments of people at different ages in their lives. And the title comes from the fact that Tolstoy learned to ride a bicycle at 75 years old. And so, Charlie, can you ride a bicycle? I used to, yes. I didn't say do you, I said can you? Yes. Okay. Then you've got to learn something this year different than riding a bicycle, <laughs> okay? And so that's the only piece of advice I can give you. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll if, if, if I have any time at the left, which I, at the end, which I won't, I'm sure, uh, reminisce a little bit about Charlie and our interactions, which go back to the board on physics and astronomy, actually back at the NRC, uh, I think when God was young, probably. Uh, uh, but let, let, me, uh, let me talk about a, an issue which I actually care about and have thought about, and it fits nicely into the, the, the crisis of facing research universities and the, and the future of research universities. Now, let me be very clear what I mean by research universities. Everybody uses that term. It's like, um, it's like a generic term, but, but, but there are many, many colleges and universities in America Research universities are a fairly small subset of those, and they have a different mission. Everything I'm going to say is my opinion at this point, because I can do that at this stage of my life, okay? So <laughs> I'm going to do it. A research university has, has, a, has, a, has a mission. It is to create new knowledge and, and to create 
the next generation of those who are going to create new knowledge. So it really has the mission of creating the innovative process and teaching, however you do that, teaching the innovative process to the next generation. That's a research university. And that's what I'm gonna talk about. I'm not gonna talk about colleges that, that, that prepare people for other careers, et cetera, not a lot. I'm gonna talk about a research university. Over 80 years ago, just before Charlie was born, uh, an American, um, um, America struggled with an economic uh, decline uh, during that period, it was in the 30s. And a young University of California physicist by the name of Ernest Lawrence um, built a new device, which was a high energy device called a synchrotron, cyclotron, sorry, a cyclotron. And um, his invention led to an entire new set of technologies, advances in science, medicine, technologies, electronics. I mean, it, it spun out to a lot of things. He thought he was doing what he thought was fundamental science. But of course, it spun into all sorts of things. And his protégés at the Berkeley lab, some of whom are near and dear to the hearts of people that are in this room right now, his protégés at the Berkeley lab pushed the U.S. ahead of Germany in the global race for technological primacy. 1930s. Upon accepting his Nobel Prize in 1939, Lawrence paid special tribute to the financial benefactors who helped him construct those instruments. And he said, the day, that, now let me quote it, the day when science, the day when the scientists, no matter how devoted, may make significant progress alone and without material help is past. That was 1939. Um, so let me, let me fast forward. I'm, I'm gonna, most of my talk's gonna be history because I, it's hard for me to predict the future. <laughs> but I can sure look at the past and give you my own take on it. So uh, uh, in, in 1968, I immigrated to the US. And the two largest companies in the world when I came into the US were AT&T, the Bell System, and General Motors. And I came to Bell Laboratories. And at 25 years old, I thought these companies would last forever. I truly did. And so I went back and I kind of looked at the history of AT&T and it was a little over 100, it's a little over 100 years old now, but it's gone. And General Motors, in the form that I knew it, is gone. So this was AT&T, went from this long distance telephone network to some red swoosh. <laughs> Remember that? Yeah. You don't, do you? I do. It was near and dear to my heart. Here I have a illegal laser somewhere. Anyway. Um, General Motors. You can go back and you can see these old General Motors insignia. Right. And these two in industries, companies, had research laboratories, industrial research labs, where they did research, where they did some fundamental research and then spun it into things that had relevance to their companies. There were many other research labs. I remember them well. I visited them all. I gave talks at them all. They came to us at Bell Laboratories. But the more important thing I would like to point out is that the relationship between these laboratories and the universities were, was very close. People moved back and forth. We hired people at Bell Laboratories from the universities that you represent. We literally hired them. They came, they left, they went back to the universities, and it was an intimate relationship. We competed with each other. General Bell Labs competed with all these laboratories. It was friendly competition, mostly, uh, but they had intimate relationships with the universities as well. 
and there was people, there was technology that transferred back and forth, and it was a very different world. They're pretty much, these laboratories are pretty much gone now. They're gone. Um, and, and it was, in my view, it was, it was that inter, interrelationship that launched America into this primary period that it had and the relationship that universities had internationally. And people have asked me, well, why are they gone? And, and this is an opinion now. Each one of these has a story. I mean, Xerox is a very interesting story, actually. Xerox was formed in Rochester, New York. And it decided it needed, to, they, they needed a research lab like everybody else. And the U.S. dominated the world economically during that period, so they could do that. And so they built a lab in California because they wanted to be able to recruit and hire the same people that we were all recruiting from various places. And the Xerox lab was a remarkable lab. Those of you that are old enough, and we're all that old if you're here celebrating Charlie, <laughs> you remember that. You remember what Xerox Palo Alto did. It was, it was stupendous. I remember thinking, holy mackerel. I mean, they, they invented the mouse. Desktop computing, Ethernet. And then the Xerox company, two minutes. <laughs> then the Xerox company said, now, let's get out of this computing stuff. We're going to make copiers. Two years later, they were hit with an antitrust suit where their domination of the U.S. copying market went from 100% to under 14%. Each one of these has a story. But I would suggest that, that these companies became so large and they became so international that they, that they would make financial decisions that were, um, that were basically in their, in their financial best interest, but not long-term decisions. And, they and, and the first to go was the research laboratories. And that association with the university, the research universities, disappeared. So next generation, what came after that? Microsoft? Apple? <coughs> Apple actually got the mouse from Xerox. And then the generation after that, it's Google, Facebook, Yahoo. The time cycle is getting shorter and shorter for these companies the time cycle before they become international. And, and I, would, I would allege their, their, their commitment to any research. On the other hand, the universities in America have a long time cycle. Look at that, Harvard, founded 1636. The most recent one, I, I'm sure I've missed some of your universities because I did this pretty quickly. Um, the most recent one is Caltech. 1891. Those are the privates. Then the, then the Morrell Land Grant Act, which created land grant, which helped create land grant universities. Now, some of these were before, so I'm, I'm, I'm making this a slight, like, slightly simpler story, but created the public institutions in America, the public research institutions. And then because I'm parochial, I keep the University of California separate. <laughs> Everybody was thinking, what the hell is he doing? I, I got all 10 of them there. I got all 10 of the campuses. And, uh, but but th these, these public, public and private research universities um, became the envy of the world. Now, I'm not sure everybody will agree with that, but I believe that that's true. They became the envy of the world. And they grew in collaboration with industry that slowly became so international that they were driven by decisions that were um, very short term. I'm not going to talk about for-profit universities. 
because they're not research universities. But I can't, I can't give a talk without saying at least I know that they're there. Um, um, the only thing I can say about them is negative, so I don't want to say it. <laughs> but, but it's the, it's the research universities. And so this is history. So I've gone through history. And, and where does it lead me? Where does it lead my thinking? It leads me to ask, how can the research universities, mostly in America, but everywhere, um, r retain their excellence and what drives them? And I believe that it's the interaction, the, the people flow, the intellectual property flow, with industrial partners. The university has a special advantage in that it can create, it can create innovative people in a much broader range. It can create innovative people in the arts and the social sciences, which can bring ethics and responsibility to corporations that otherwise wouldn't have them. And so the, the close relationship with universities and industry must exist, and I believe that's our challenge as we go forward. The relationship between, and I'm I, this is America, I'm talking about America because it is so wonderful to be in America, because I, I, I'm an immigrant. The American Research University and the American industry, whatever that is, has to, has to figure out how to work through that really complicated bubble of people, intellectual property, government agencies, life sciences and healthcare, and all the complications associated with it in a way that the university, the research university, will benefit from those strong interactions. And industry will benefit from the research universities through those strong interactions. And that, I believe, is a challenge for the research universities as we go forward. And I think we have to redefine it because what happened that I, I grew up with in the 60s and 70s no longer exists because of the globalization of corporations. And so we have to redefine it. Now, just in reminiscent, reminiscence with Charlie. Um, Charlie, I, we first met at the, uh, at the board in physics and astronomy. It was in the uh, 80s? Yeah, it was about in the 80s. Yeah, it was about 88. And Charlie chaired the board in physics and astronomy. And we were both young. Grr. <laughs> and, um, and uh, interacted very, he was, a, he was an astrophysicist then. Uh, he didn't know any of this stuff in those days. Uh, and I remember the next time, the next memory that springs to mind was Charlie and I sitting on a bench at University House, right up there, overlooking the, um, overlooking Black's Beach as I was trying to talk him into coming to UCSD because I was chancellor at the time. And I'm very proud of you. Happy birthday, Charlie. Glad to be here. Okay. Bob, thank you very much. And uh, I think now Margaret Leinen is going to talk next. So, you know, Charlie made, uh, he invited all of his friends, all the people that he wanted to hear from. And I just have to tell you, Charlie, putting me between Bob Dines and Pradeep Khosla, <laughs> this is, the, <laughs> it's an act of love that I'm, I'm giving this talk between those two. Uh, especially on the topic that is their bread and butter, which is, uh, the research university and the future of the research university. But uh, I've been around long enough that uh, 
Uh, and, and like Bob, I'm going to say that I'm talking about universities, not colleges or community colleges or whatnot. But I've been around long enough to see a couple of uh, times when the, at least in the US, the, the national conversation was about the doom of the university and that uh, these dinosaurs uh, that had lived for so long and grown so large and thought they were so great uh, were, were going to fail. And uh, the first of those that I remember well was the 80s and 90s, and there the, the argument was that universities had become too expensive to survive and that uh, you couldn't get a, an education for a reasonable price. Everybody was going to flee these, uh, these uh, very expensive uh, places. And uh, we saw, uh, we saw a, a real crunch with, uh, on, the, on the state university side, state support decreasing. All of you know that very well. For most uni state universities, the percentage is far less than 30% now, but there are a couple that are up there. And at the same time, state support for the community colleges and the state colleges did not, you know, they were challenged too, but not nearly as much, and that was justified on the, the issue of access. So um, in, in uh, providing access, uh, states really uh, dealt a much more difficult financial hand to universities. At the same time, uh, the cost of compliance with uh, just an incredible host of uh, regulations and, and compliance issues from both federal and state skyrocketed. Uh, there was a, a wonderful uh, piece that came out, I think just yesterday, uh, a survey of, uni of uh, faculty at uh, research universities that said our faculty are now spending 42% of their time doing administration. Now, National Science Board has taken this up as a cause, and it's about time. Uh, that's all I can say about that. Um, at the same time, the cost of living adjusted support for research from federal government peaked and began to decline in spurt in spite of having a better reputation with federal government after the Nixon administration, and in spite of the bubble that we saw from uh, the doubling of NIH, which certainly uh, kept things at bay. So why, you know, uh, so this was uh, all doom and gloom, and we're still here. And as Bob says, you know, we're still vibrant. Um, people still come. And, uh, and I think that the, uh, we'll talk a little about, uh, or I'm going to end with a few observations about why I think uh, we've been able to survive. But if, if the finances were going to be the, the, the uh, death blow, uh, certainly the last seven years would have been the end. Uh, between the state crunch, the crunch on uh, endowments in private universities, the crunch in public, uh, in, in people's pocketbooks and their ability to send people to college, and yet all of the major research uh, institutions in this country are full. So. That, that doom and gloom about being too expensive to, to survive has not been, uh, in spite of the mantra that we were too expensive to survive and had to decrease cost, I think there was a lot of, of uh, increasing efficiency and a lot of uh, taking a serious look at what we were doing and making sure that it was the best possible thing to do with our money. But I don't think that argument of being too expensive uh, works. So the second era, I think, is the one that we're in. And it's that, and now it's universities are out of touch with how people learn, uh, with social media, with modern technology, and we will wither away uh, as a result of that. 
And so uh, the first stage of that was uh, e-learning, and uh, uh, it was Educause that was really the, the prophet here saying that, uh, and uh, Brian Dawkins, former administrator at Brown, <coughs> who said that uh, universities were not uh, poised to, to use these capabilities, and in fact, we were so bad at it that we had to have a nonprofit, uh, actually several started up like Educause, that were gonna uh, save us by providing this content uh, in, in a, a reasonable fashion. Stage two, I think, is this whole issue of massively open courses. And it wasn't so, I think the, the challenge there uh, was the challenge of not so much Coursera, uh, which, um, which really wanted to work with universities, but Udacity, which said, uh, we're taking over. And we will, you will generate the, the content um, the best minds in the world will provide it, will provide it at low cost. And certainly Sebastian Thrun was, was the, the high priest of this, or the prophet. Uh, interestingly enough, about a year ago at um, uh, Techonomy, uh, he got up on the stage with, uh, with Wall Street Journal uh, to talk about this and said, well, I think that our, our financial model was a failure. And, and the reason was that they didn't understand how people wanted to use MOOCs. And most people did not want to get an entire university education from a MOOC. They wanted to use it to sample. And when I was an undergraduate, uh, I had six different majors through the time that I was there. I was sampling. And, I, and, and in this particular university I was in, in order to do that, I really had to sort of sw keep switching majors uh, because of all those prerequisites. And people really want that ability to, uh, to savor what's out there. And they see MOOCs as a way of doing that. And so there is a, a, you know, an understanding now that only about a third of the people who sign up for it will ever take one of the lectures. Uh, only about a third of those who take one lecture uh, will be there halfway through. Only about a third of those will ever complete the course. And it's not because everybody's lazy and dumb, it's because they were testing the waters. They wanted to see if, if that fabulous course um, was, was something that they wanted. Um, so th these are for-profit venture capital uh, companies, and I think that um, my personal opinion is that if I were betting on universities or I was betting on these, I'd bet on the university. So the latest in this is the electronically enhanced university, and the competitive model here is Minerva. Uh, so the, uh, Minerva went out and, and recruited uh, Stephen Koslin, who is a, uh, a wonderful uh, cognitive neuroscientist who was the, the dean uh, at Harvard, and, and really uh, uh, believes in the, the the whole issue of how people learn and how, how pedagogy is applied should go into universities. And so what they've proposed is a totally electronic university uh, with embodying all of this, um, of what we've learned about how people learned and how people teach. And uh, from, the, there's a wonderful article uh, in a recent Atlantic about it. And the, one of the, the students talks about the intense experience of going through one class because it's not a lecture. In fact, the, they're, they're not lectures at all. You're expected to get all of your material somewhere else, like from the web. Um, and this is really a way of, of accessing that and learning about it by a lot of the things that we know work, like uh, teaching, teaching each other, and like rapid uh, review of material. So, uh, you know, um, Ben Nelson has told uh, universities that he thinks that they're dinosaurs again and this is the way forward. 
I think this too, it's a wonderful, I'm not, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn about pedagogy and we shouldn't learn about how people learn, but what's missing in that model? And it is what I think is uh, the essence of the university and it's another piece of the essence that, uh, that Bob talks about. It's the physical community uh, it's the hands-on experience and it's the authentic research experience that we can provide. Now, uh, I don't think we know much about or we haven't investigated for ourselves uh, what the competitive advantage is of physical learning communities. We talk about them, we say it's better to learn in a group uh, than not learn into, in a group and that there's something going on uh, when, uh, where? when those kids are, are, are standing there, they're not just looking for the green flash. Um, there's, there's, there's an active process going on. Uh, but I think that we need to learn more about that and be willing to and able to uh, discuss what it is about that physical learning community uh, that is advantageous and then be able to, to show uh, what competitive advantage is. We do know what hands-on experience does. We, we know that and we know its importance. Um, I think we, we do know and understand and there has been a lot of research to show that authentic research experience is really the heart of, of true learning. And uh, maybe we should consider partnering with some with the onlines who can't provide this. Uh, maybe you know we ought to be, I think, a little bit more open about thinking about what business models uh, we use in universities, and that probably is some place where we can learn. So, are we doomed, or must we do better? I don't think we're doomed. I don't think that the the challenge of uh, of all of this electronic way or, or social media way of getting together and getting credit for something uh, is going to put research universities out of business. And in fact, I think that unless they find a way to partner to get that hands-on experience or that authentic research experience, that they are doomed. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, sit back and, and ignore those, those developments. I think that we, where we're slow is getting in front of new ideas about how we work as opposed to the content uh, rather than reacting to them. And so I'm very bullish on, on research universities for many of the same reasons that Bob is. But I do think that uh, we've got a long way to go in, in being uh, entrepreneurial, not innovative, but entrepreneurial. And that's the place where I think we could improve. Thanks. Thank you very much, Margaret. And now it's my pleasure to introduce Pradeep Koshla, the Chancellor of UCSD. Thanks, Nigella, and welcome, everybody. But uh, before I say something, let me just say happy birthday, Charlie. It is such a great honor to know you. Uh, when I got here about two years ago, uh, Charlie was one of the first people, uh, Charlie and Ellen, uh, besides, after Walter and uh, Mary were first people, again, all from SIO, to welcome us uh, to this uh, great city and to this great university. And uh, I was not responsible for hiring you, Charlie. I realize that. I was also not responsible for asking you to retire. I realize that. <laughs> but I can tell you that I've been the beneficiary of all the good work you've done because uh, the gravity waves that you have left behind, uh, your good work, uh, and the long time constant waves, uh, they really are still rippling through UC San Diego and SIO. If you see the strength of SIO, it's all because of, uh, mainly, but largely because of what Charlie did uh, right before. Uh, Tony, uh, and then Tony, and then now uh, Margaret. So thank you very much, I really appreciate this. You're an icon out here. Uh, I would actually give you a 3D printer picture of yourself, uh, but, but somehow Larry would not give me access to the 3D printer. <laughs> okay, so people wanted me to talk about uh, research universities, and you know, you've heard, I think, two great uh, 
talks from Bob Dines and Margaret. And as I was listening to them, I was wondering actually, is it really true that research universities are going to be around uh, in about 50, 70, 100 years? If you think about it, we've been around for more than 300 years. So I don't think in terms of 10-year time constants. You know, we are like very slowly moving uh, organisms. So our time constants are very large. So I'm thinking 50, 100 years from now. And let me show you a hypothesis, or at least argue a point where I think the research universities are going to be in a little bit more trouble than they need to be. Uh, and the reason I say this is because research universities are in a, what I think of as an extremely hyper-competitive stage right now, where the whole idea of a research university is not to do great research and impact the local economy as much as it is to improve your ranking. And as soon as you focus on improving your ranking as a research university as your criteria for success, you become hyper-competitive. And what this maps into are startup packages that are going north of like $1.5, $2 million. Um, not that I'm jealous, but just so that you know. So my background is robotics. I got my PhD at Carnegie Mellon. Uh, I was one of the first PhDs there. And robotics was an exper a very experimental field, and it was an expensive field. When I was looking for jobs in 86, not that long ago, I'm very young. Uh, <laughs> oh, come on. So uh, the startup package there was like, $30,000 and uh, two PhD student years, and then if you could not get a grant in the first year or two, uh, you were gonna be toast. Uh, fast forward 2014, 2012 when I got here, and now since I'm in the business of allocating budgets, you see, I am the only one who doesn't get to ask anybody for money. <laughs> right? I only have to give money, so I have to count what's coming in, and that's not I don't get to ask, I'm just given and that's it. Take it or leave it and then that's it. So, since I'm in that business now, I'm looking at the cost of doing business. And the cost of doing business is extremely high. And I say this with uh, a lot of gravity because it causes me a great deal of concern. And we UC San Diego supposedly uh, are not that rich, uh, but somehow we are surviving. But I can tell you that right now we have come to a stage where when somebody gets a counter offer, our counter to that counter offer is not just a salary anymore. It is a salary plus the new startup package. And people have come to a point, or faculty members, where startup packages are making research happen, which is fine if you have the money. And what that means is the university is dipping into its own resources to support research, which is exactly the opposite of why this, what happened here post-World War II or pre-World War II. It was the U.S. government that was reducing the risk of developing technology. It was the U.S. government that was uh, giving us a chance to discover uh, the laws of physics and biology and so on and so on so forth, and therefore reducing the risk. And now we, the universities, have kind of become pseudo-venture capitalists without realizing what we are doing. And if we don't get this under control, I think we are going down a path where we are all going to eat each other up, and the rich will survive, and the poor will go away. Which would be fine if you're rich, but it would not be fine for this country. Right? For the 10 or 12 universities whose endowments got north of five, seven, ten billion dollars, it'd be okay. But for this country, it would not be good because research universities have played a very important role in economic development. And so if you look at the country right now, there's 300 research universities. And if in the end only 20 survive, that means there are 20 cities, actually no, more like 10 cities, because some of these big cities, like Boston has like three or four of them, Chicago has uh, two or three of them. Uh, they are the ones that are gonna be around and everybody else is gonna be trouble and the country is gonna be in trouble. So that causes me great concern. So just file this away. Uh, I think it's gonna take about 50 years to get there. Uh, the second thing that is happening is something that Larry talked about. We are in a society right now where there are two things going on very aggressively. One is the difference between the rich haves and have nots is expanding very fast. And the second is the cost of producing the N plus one version of anything is going down to zero. So if you think about MOOCs, you can think about, if you, okay, let's start with data storage. The cost of storing that extra bit is going down to, is about zero. The cost of transmitting that extra bit is about zero. The cost of computing on that extra bit is about zero, right? That's not the only thing. Because of that technology, the cost of teaching that extra student 
assuming that uh, we go, assuming that the MOOCs and uh, e-learning all come into play, and they will come into play, is about zero. But that's not the big thing. The big thing is that it is what used to be a, a society of producers and consumers and economics and uh, money transacting between the two is now becoming a, a society where the producer is the consumer and everybody is producing and everybody is consuming. And we might come to a point where there'd be no notion of a company that is a producer or a university that's a producer and uh, students that are consumers. Every student would be a producer and every student would be a consumer. And you can see that's going to fundamentally change the notion of education. And the reason we have not seen that right now is because we still have a bunch of Luddites, and many of us in there, right here, because we don't understand how to use digital technology for uh, content acquisition and learning. But go over like 20, 30, 40 years when my kids are my age and they started their life in the digital world, I think you will see a very different world. Now you ask yourself what happens to research. It's the same thing. If you can imagine that you could capture the world and store it in a computer with reasonable amount of fidelity, which means you have great microscopes, you have great sensors, and you have great storage, and you can catch, capture and put the world in, uh, in a computer. And the way, uh, to give you an example, Larry's example was a good one, where like one, one billion of his, uh, uh, micro, uh, microbiome is in the computer. Now there is no reason to think that only a faculty member can do research. If you then take this data, imagine creating a digital human being. It's not just physically digital. The proteomics, metabolomics, microbiome, just about everything is somehow digitally captured, right? On one hand, I can say you can do uh, you can do an experiment or you can do a drug trial of one. On the other hand, I can say the way to do that is to open up this human being to the rest of the world and let the smartest people access the data and act on it and let them discover uh, what is the disease and how is it gonna be cured. And now suddenly you realize that the domain of research is not limited to universities because they have the infrastructure. It is the smarts and access to data that is gonna create research. It, that's the way it's gonna change. And I think this is not gonna happen tomorrow, but again, 50, 70, 80 years from now, I can guarantee you, or not, I cannot guarantee you, I'm sorry. Uh, now I'm the chancellor, I can guarantee you. Uh, I won't be around. Uh, I think that's where we are headed. So the point I'm trying to make is, it is fine and dandy, and I do the same thing, for us to be comfortable and say, you know, universities are not gonna change. That is probably true in my lifetime or in my career lifetime, but that's not true going far into the future. And as great academics, as great thinkers, I think we have to position our university, our students, our kids for the future. So we need to be focused on that. Thank you very much, and thank you, Charlie. I should say that when I turn 75, Ellen's gonna do my birthday party. She puts on a good one. <laughs>if we have any time for questions for that panel or whether you think it's time to go straight into refreshments, Charlie. Well, I'll take a vote on that, but I would, <laughs> I would not like myself to stand in the way of uh, food. <laughs> it's your birthday, so. <coughs> yeah. Why don't we just, uh, I think I will leave all your lives by that. So why don't we, first of all, I, Joe, I, I want to thank you for chairing the last and most wonderful of the sessions. Each one got better. So thank you very well, thank much you, for your friendship. Uh, it'll be Wednesday or Thursday before I figured out what happened at this meeting. <laughs> and so, but there are uh, two people that, two folks that I should thank. First of all, of course, Margaret has been uh, absolutely wonderful in making the facilities of the university available to us, uh, and especially to Donna Shabke, who helped us arrange everything and caught most of the mistakes that we were about to make. Uh, second of all, 
uh, you all understand that you are my birthday present. Each one of you who is here is a present. Your, your presence is the present. And many of you worked very hard intellectually uh, in giving the talks, and the rest of you worked very hard intellectually to understand them. <laughs> and so thank you all. That was the best present of all. And then finally, I think I just have to say, uh, to the love of my life, Ellen, thank you. You made this party, and I am forever grateful. Thank you. <laughs>